Yeah, let's start with what I want to talk about today is uh, uh, the idea of uh, politics of engagement in relation to art theory, art practice, and uh, artists in uh, general. And I will try to lay out a few ideas about the political dimension of art and also use a few examples from contemporary art practice. Uh, and these examples that I'm going to be using have to do uh, with, it, uh, with the way art structures uh, the political and the body's the critical dimension. As an art historian, I have uh, this habit to look backwards. So a few times I will move back to the uh, 20th century in order to make some conclusions and uh, to clarify some, uh, some thoughts. But first, I would like to uh, give you a context uh, uh, within which I'm going to be speaking about. What I've been thinking about lately is uh, how the European Union's uh, highest ideals are eroding, uh, ideals of a democratic, peaceful, and pluralistic group of nations as EU's founders envisioned it. The defeat of the Soviet Union at that time uh, the greatest enemy of the West 25 years ago didn't in fact bring peace, prosperity and unity. And in the fact, in the meantime, European Union has grown into a fortress of fractious, hostile and authoritarian politics. And it is in fact only now with the Eurozone crisis and the refugee crisis that we are finally becoming aware that the resurrection of nationalism, racism, xenophobia, walls and frontiers growing along these predicaments is in fact a result of uh, European EU politics. It is not, then not surprising that uh, the number of protests in Europe is growing and particularly from 2010 uh, with the workers and the students protests uh, against anti-austerity measures that took place in Spain, Greece, Portugal, Ireland, but also in Germany recently, to overall protests, activities, and uh, initiatives on different scales against the European anti-migratory policies. So what, what does these uh, protests tell us? These protests and the grassroots express a desire for a change, a growing solidarity among people in demands for another politics. Politics that are not dri driven by the imposition of universal economic principles and universal uh, laws that, as we all know, are only bringing to conflicts and to antagonism or to nationalism and xenophobia, as I already mentioned. So the question that was rising out of these thoughts for me was, how can we move beyond politics that appropriate all differences under the universal economic and moral laws. How can we challenge dominant politics in order to propose other forms of collectivity? Are we able to generate new ways of living together out of protests? And I'm particularly interested in how art theory, art practice, and artists in general can contribute to the movements initiatives and practices that criticize current politics and mobilize solidarity of people around key issues like political, economic issues, touching upon the questions of uh, economy and the political. And in fact, I'm very much interested in how art creates situations which can mobilize us to engage into the creation of other ways of living together, or to put it in the words of this biennial, how together. You may think that I count too much uh, on art when it comes to social and political change, but in fact, I believe that artists are those people who can not only anticipate social change, they can also mobilize it. They can make numerous excluded voices heard, propel particular affects, and inspire all of us to think that the society invested with other politics, with other ethics, ethical and political values is still possible. And that would be much more actually appropriate for the migrating network and uh, uh, multinational society we are living in nowadays. 
And I would like to approach these questions that I raised from the theoretical point of view and using some examples from art practice. First of all, I wanted to say something about the theoretical frame I will uh, uh, be speaking. I will be speaking from. Uh, in order to clarify uh, some positions and, uh, in fact, uh, uh, to, make, to make these uh, examples that I'm going to be talking about in the second part more clear. So I want to say something about this theoretical frame. And for that matter, I would like to draw your attention to the dominant political discourses in art theory today. So dominant political discourses in art theory today, which are dealing with the relation between art and politics and trying to grasp what the critical dimension of art is. So these main uh, uh, discourses are discourse on uh, absolute democracy, as is proposed by Antonio Negri and Michel Hart, very much present in art theory nowadays. Discourse on anarchism, which is proposed by Jacques Rancière, also very much present in art theory, and a discourse of agonism or antagonism as is proposed by Ernesto Laclau and uh, Chantal Mouffe. But drawing a distinction between these theoretical standpoints, as you will see, my aim is to show why theoretical discourses on absolute democracy and agonism, which neglect representation, either by arguing a creation of a plenty to the new concepts, let's say for new movements or new forms of art, or by failing to engage with the content of representation by suggesting politics of arbitrariness, why they may become appropriated by dominant politics and depleted from their critical role. In my view, these political discourses, which argue politics of withdrawal from established institutions and representations may not provide a proper ground for debating the critical in art. And on the other hand, I would therefore like to show how discourse on agonism, which supports politics of engagement, allows the theory to question the content of representation and values invested in this representation, and in such a way provide a ground for debating what the critical in art today it is. So with regards to agonism, I support the idea that art plays an important role in the way we construct reality around us, and uh, as such that art may either perpetuate or subvert dominant politics. But what interests me in this context is exactly how art subverts, challenge, and disrupts politics. How does it engage with social events, existing institutions, and the representations they foster in order to contribute to the overall struggle for other forms of politics? What kind of relations it established with other social practices, activities, and movements in its endeavor for the political and social change? And I want to suggest that we can think the critical dimension of art in relation to artistic politics of engagement with institutions and representations they construct. To support this argument, I will particularly look at the artworks uh, created uh, within European Union, let's say, from 2000. And especially I will put focus on artworks dealing with the question of migrations and uh, refugee crisis. So I will depart from the work of Tanya Ostojic her actions, performances, and interventions created from 2000 directly appropriated migrant strategies of border crossings and interventions in the media flow. With her project, Looking for a Husband with a New Passport, Ostojic pointed out that the firm relation between migration, prostitution, human trafficking, and capitalism my second reference will be Christoph Schlingensiv's uh, public art project, Foreigner South, created in 2000. Schlingensiv con confined asylum seekers in container and uh, situated those containers in the center of uh, Vienna. And over a week, people could follow their everyday life via cameras that were installed in these containers and vote them out of the country in the manner of Big Brother. Schlingensiv's project wanted to emphasize xenophobia and 
anti-migratory politics of the current political government at the time of Austria, Freedom Party, nationalist government. And finally, I will try to turn to your attention Europe today and different movements, initiatives, and uh, actions taken by individuals, associations, and artists in response to the refugee crisis. I will recall initiatives by Center for Political Beauty and also Raoul Haspel. Oh, I forgot about slides. Yeah, those are names that I will be mentioning. My goal is to show how art engaged in the current state of affairs may contribute to the overall aspiration towards challenging, confronting, and re-articulating existing uh, politics and norms of representation. <coughs> By bringing forth not only the very recent examples from artistic practice, but also artists' active involvement in the current predicaments, I would like to ask the following question. What can we all here, artists, curators, academics, programmers, people of different profiles or the visitors, what can we do to incite other forms of living together? And what kind of actions we can take at the very moment of any political crisis? How can we stand against dominant politics that are eroding basic rights for freedom and liberty? So before moving to those, uh, moving focus to those examples that I just mentioned, I would like to clarify uh, what I've been thinking of, uh, under terms uh, artistic politics of withdrawal and artistic politics of engagement uh, when I'm drawing also uh, upon the theory of uh, agonism. I've been in fact thinking lately how some uh, 20th century artistic practices like the avant-garde or different vanguard movements failed in attempt to bring art and politics together in order to structure the critical in art. To understand why, we should look back at their goal, which was often directed towards the creation of a society anew from the absolute beginning. Here you can think of Dada movements, you can think of, uh, for example, Bassian Adler's nihilism or fluxus claiming to be non-art or anti-art. So it seems that precisely by ways of claiming an absolute beginning and self-creation that these counter-art movements withdrew from mainstream art. And in fact, by means of withdrawal, counter-art precluded itself from the greater change with uh, mainstream representations. In fact, de developing parallel to mainstream art, various counter-art movements have been built in the oppositional relation to modernism and allowed the power of modernity to simply absorb demands for the absolute beginning and subjugate them to the appeals of capital. Arguing politics of withdrawal from the existing institutions and representations, political discourse on absolute democracy in art theory, which aim to grasp the relation between art and politics, certainly leads by applying the strategies of withdrawal uh, to the failure to grasp what the critical dimension of art it is. So with this in mind, With this in mind, I think that in contrast to the artistic politics of withdrawal, we need today artistic politics of engagement, moving away from the autonomous conceptions of art towards its relational aspect. And this is important, to move from uh, uh, autonomous conceptions of art towards relational aspect of art. So it, this would say that we cannot see relations between uh, mainstream art and counter-art anymore in oppositional relations because by the logical uh, necessity of opposites, they will bring to the same. But we have to think about them in paradoxical relations, uh, which would say that they're always different, 
uh, they're constituted to each other, they influence each other, but they would never may overcome the limits between themselves. In my view, this focus on a relational dimension of art, or maybe a radical relational dimension of art, could provide art with the possibility to challenge institutions and norms of representations. And it is political discourse on agonism that provides this ground. But it is not enough to simply claim that there is a paradoxical relation between counter art or, and mainstream art, art that is trying to subvert dominant representations and politics and one that is actually trying to support them. It is more important and necessary to recognize that art is entangled with different social practices, activities and initiatives in a particular network of relations that structure the political. And only when we acknowledge that art possess this relational aspect, we can think of its critical role. But let's, let's observe this, uh, try to imagine actually this situation. Let's say that, let's say that art uh, is responding to the current state of affairs and that uh, it is existing in relation to different social movements and practices. And let's say that it wants to uh, represent uh, demands by different groups that are gathered in a struggle for their recognition. And let's say that these social groups are women, gay, transsexual, migrants, or black people, and that they are actually all together gathered around the recognition of the demands for freedom and liberty that they are restricted from. And let's say at the end that they share similar political and ethical values. So to present these demands, art in fact needs to challenge existing politics. And we may speak here about the authoritarian politics that control the media, uh, that restrict uh, freedom of speech in public space, and that restrict protests in public space, let's say. But since art representation supports to present uh, different demands that are gathered around some uh, common uh, demands for freedom and liberty, we can expect that they can never represent them in totality. There is always something that is staying outside, something that is excluded. For that matter, we can have two conclusions that excluded which will always be able to challenge the existing representation and at the same time uh, that each representation is never a totality. It's a partial, it's a contingent issue, temporarily fixed, and it, will, it may always be challenged by the excluded. Of course, these questions, this statement brings us to the question, but which representation or which system of values, ethical and political values, is the right one? I will certainly go for this system where you have a possibility to choose, to exclude something, because only in that case where you have a possibility of choice, you can speak about freedom and liberty. But what does this say ab about the critical dimension of art? Well, by recognizing that art embodies a particular system of relations, I would like to suggest that art together with the different social activities and in initiatives may confront existing institutions, disrupt and rearticulate them. And it is only by employing politics of engagement that it may challenge representations invested in particular political values and propose different forms of social relations and different ethics and politics. In my view, it is precisely here in the creation of a collective will that the critical dimension of art is constituted. So I would like now to turn to a few examples from the contemporary art practice, mainly from the field of performing arts. And uh, I need to say that uh, my decision to speak about performing arts is not uh, an arbitrary thing. You probably remember that already with the uh, avant-garde, 
there were some traces of relational aspects of performances to actual events, everyday occurrences, uh, ordinary objects, and the common movements. Merging performances with everyday life was a way to express artistic rebellion against the institution of art dissociated with the life praxis of man, as Peter Berger said a long time ago. But nevertheless, in Tanzimfai, then reiterated from the 60s, the relational aspect of performances, which initially aimed to destabilize and to dislocate autonomous, apolitical, and aestheticized language of mainstream art, has been manipulated and gradually incorporated in the reign of consumption to be finally aestheticized in the capitalist world in the 1990s. Very interesting, interesting comment on relational aspect of art gave Claire Bishop. Uh, she was trying to make uh, a difference between uh, relational art in the 60s and the 70s and those after in the 90s. And she was saying actually that artists like from Fluxus uh, or uh, Alan Ruppersberg have been using relational art to avoid the art market uh, and by, let's say, cooking to earn some money to survive outside of avoid institutions in a way. But in the 90s, it was happening exactly opposite. Uh, with Rikrit Tiravania, for example, we had direct support of the art market uh, and uh, dominant politics. So as it turns out, reiteration of this relational aspect in art allowed for the control and subsumption of the critical and activities potential of performances to the hegemonic power of the modern and the postmodern. And this is how the relational aspect of movement has been continuously manipulated and regulated by the protocols of the contemporary control society. But can art still succeed in mobilizing a critical potential? Yes, it can. If nothing else, art definitely created conditions against we can think politics of engagement. In contrast to artistic politics of withdrawal, we can think how art may engage with institutions and change them, how it can speak about collective will instead of individuality. And we have to think critical art today in relation to particular social and political contexts, the state of affairs art is inscribed in, and institutions which represent them in order to not only bring a critical dimension of art for the sake of art or for my speech here tonight, but for the social change in general. So let's see how does this look in, a, in art practice. Uh, the example that I will use have to do with the ways art structures the political and uh, emphasize the importance of the critical dimension of art today. And I will begin with Tanya Ostojic. Over the years, Ostojic is engaged in questioning EU migration policies. She directly familiarized herself with popular border crossing strategies that migrants have been using for ages. And as Ostojic explains herself, in order to take her own right uh, that she has been restricted from by current EU laws, she explicitly applied strategies of provoking public sphere, violation of law, also using loopholes in order to move freely and to live and work where she really wants. So first, in 2000, in 2000, he did one of the first actions at the border between uh, Slovenia and Austria. At that time, Slovenia hasn't been a part of European Union. It became only in 2004, together with some uh, artists, friends from Austria. Uh, she was trying to illegally cross the border. It was a spot between Slovenia and Austria where usually eight to nine people got caught every day. After this action, which didn't succeed, she went back to Belgrade and she decided to submit application to Austrian embassy. 
She collected a pile of papers. She appeared there in front at six o'clock in the morning. And uh, she was in a queue until noon. She didn't have a chance before closing, actually, the embassy to submit her applications. And finally, she decided to do something uh, completely different. She decided to find a husband uh, with a new passport and to marry, and in such a way to leave Serbia and to go and to live in the European Union. This piece doesn't only thematize migration, as you can think of immediately. It also emphasizes how capitalism and gender politics underlies it. Of course, shocking is uh, its extra, extra uh, exaggerated nudity. Ostage ironizes is truth about migrations. The traffic with women, prostitution, pragmatic marriages, and all other side effects of migration. She described the collision between isolation, poverty, and EU's policies of exclusion. And in fact, who can qualify to live in the European Union and who may not? Ostrich received more than 500 offers via internet. This image was published on internet. There is her email address, Hot Tanya. And she actually received messages from all around the world. She married uh, with a German artist. And that was intervention in the medium of law. She moved to Germany. And after five years, when she received the uh, residency permit to live there, she organized a divorce party in a gallery where she presented the whole project. We are speaking now about 2005, and Tanya is still working on the same issue on migrations. At the same time, we are witnessing the strengthening of nationalism within the European Union, and along with it, the anti-migratory policies. In 2000, Christoph Schlingensiv's public art project, Foreigners Out, put the focus on the rights and asylum seekers in Austria. In this project, he confined asylum seekers in containers, like that you've seen here in the image. And uh, they were installed in the center of Vienna over a week and enabled people to follow how these asylum seekers are living in. So there were seven of them over seven uh, uh, days, and each day, audience could vote one asylum seeker out. The asylum seeker who would remain the last would win an Austrian spouse, an Austrian immigration permit. Challenging frontiers between art and life, between the fictions This is just an image from inside that you can see. Challenging frontiers between art and life, between fictions and reality. This project didn't only reveal nationalistic and xenophobic effects among Austrians by employing the public system of voting. It also mobilized a wave of protests which were happening on the public space, on the Herbert von Karajan Square where this whole event was uh, taking place. A lot of people have been gathering around, nationalists uh, who were trying to attack people who were uh, in containers, but also leftists who were trying to free them. And the square became actually a place for public debate. And this public debate, soon after it moved to a lot of newspapers, journals, and the TV, and it became a big debate. And finally, this is going to be bringing to the failure of uh, the political party of uh, nationalist, nationalist uh, political party of Austria. Here you can see just some of the images and uh, scenes that were taking place in front of. But today, immigrants to Europe are pre predominantly refugees and uh, uh, sorry, refugees and asylum seekers, Pe people who from from war, internal conflict, or a brutal dictator in their countries of origin, such as Syria. Eritrea, Somalia, or Afghanistan. And for them, Europe is a chance 
to feel full the basic rights they were restricted from for freedom and for liberty. To deny anyone of these basic rights doesn't only go against the essence of the ethics. Geneva International Center for Justice, released on 27 July 2015, has pointed out that the term economic migrant has been used for the refugees to mask the responsibility of Europe to provide asylum. In fact, by doing so, European Union created a false perception of refugees and asylum seekers across its theor theory, uh, territory, supporting stiff migratory policies and the construction of new falls and new frontiers in Europe, such as frontiers between uh, Spain and Morocco. I don't know if there is a pointer here and what to push, maybe this. Spain and Morocco here, they have a territory still in Morocco, yeah? Between Turkey and Bulgaria, very new wall here between Serbia and Hungary, and a very, very new wall between Hungary and Croatia. At the same time, there is another border, Mediterranean Sea between Africa, Middle East, and Europe. And uh, the program of the Italian government, Mare Nostrum, which had for the goal to rescue people who were trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea and to reach European Union, uh, got pulled out. The consequence of this pull-out factor was terrific. 850 people died, and in 2015, 2,000 people droned right at the doorstep of Europe. Can we play now? President of Italy's Chamber of Deputies, I don't know if you have Laura a Boudrini, used to work for the UN's refugee agency and is the most vocal politician on the issue. Why did Mare Nostrum come to an end? Mare Nostrum è terminata perché di fatto aveva un costo molto elevato, 9 milioni di euro al mese, e questo per il nostro paese è diventato un costo forse troppo alto. Quindi è importante che adesso tutti i paesi si facciano carico del salvataggio delle vite nel Mediterraneo perché quella è frontiera europea e dunque è giusto che ognuno faccia la propria parte. Some in Mare of a pull Molti politici non sanno come si vive quando ci sono i bombardamenti, le persecuzioni e dunque facilmente dicono queste cose senza capire il senso profondo di questo. Una persona che fugge da una guerra che fugge da una situazione di violenza generalizzata, sicuramente non si pone la domanda uh, di che tipo di operazione c'è in mare, quindi non credo che sia un pull factor. Nonostante Mare Nostrum, però, almeno 3.000 persone sono morte e queste sono cifre inquietanti, terribili. Sono cifre che ricordano una guerra ed è una guerra in cui non possiamo rimanere a guardare. In termini di salvataggio in mare, Io mi auguro che veramente eh, l'operazione di Frontex, Triton, abbia le risorse, abbia i mezzi necessari per poter fare altrettanto, perché altrimenti noi rischiamo che ci saranno tanti più morti. E allora chi risponderà poi di tutte quelle morti? When it comes to the responsibility for rescue missions in the Mediterranean, there appears to be a gray zone, with Italy pointing to Europe and Europe saying it's Italy's duty. In February 2015, at least 300 people died on their way from Libya to Italy in dinghies sent out by smugglers into a violent storm. According to the UN's refugee agency, in January 2015, 60% more migrants attempted the journey to Italy compared to 2014. The difference now is that Mare Nostrum is gone and Frontex Triton lacks capacity for large-scale rescues. The increasing number of migrants and refugees risking their lives to get to Europe are now completely at the mercy of the deadly sea.
Okay, let's stay here for the moment. It's a beautiful image. Uh, this situation have been mobilizing people. They have been mobilizing, uh, they were private initiatives. For example, in 2014, where Mare Nostrum operation that we were speaking about now got canceled, uh, Christopher Catramboni, a wealthy businessman from uh, United States, he decided to invest his own money, $8 million, to buy a boat, which at a certain moment was the only boat at the Mediterranean Sea to help people and to save lives, actually, at the sea. Their foundation, the Migrant Offshore Aid Station, in the first week saved 227 lives and by now more than 11,000. In April 2015, Brighton Beach was covered in 200 body bags as Amnesty International volunteers raised awareness of the plight of the thousands of the people with the message, don't let them drown. The Center for Political Beauty, a collective of artists and activists, whose statement is art must hurt, irritate, and resist, and is a kind of response to famous statement of or work of Marina Abramovic from the 70s, art must be beautiful, artists must be beautiful. In June 2015, they started an action under the name The Dead Are Coming. And the dead in question are actually a migrant woman who drowned together with her daughter in the Mediterranean Sea. They contacted her relatives and decided to, and offered to bring her body to Germany and to organize a funeral. And this is very important because you have to know that these people who drowned in the Mediterranean Sea, they're for weeks capped in the refrigerators and finally they're buried collectively or individually, but without name and uh, without any religious sign or any sign, there is no numbers or nothing. Uh, for this action, uh, it was a public funeral and all the politicians have been invited uh, together with Angela Merkel and her husband. And of course, they didn't appear at this funeral. There are different uh, opinions about such an action. I'm not putting a question here if this is art or not. I'm speaking about uh, what artists can do uh, in, in such a moment, very urgent moment. So there is a critique that this action highlights the powerlessness of victims. And in the truth, it's taking, it's taking away the last thing they have. But then there are other statements by human rights spokesman for the Green Party, Volker Beck, who gave an ambivalent, actually, uh, um, statement about. It is offensive and impious to use the dead refugees as an object in an artistic intervention. But Beck, he also sees necessity for these kind of actions because for him the European Union must do everything to identify those people who died. Katja Kipping, leader of the left party, said that this action is pushing limits and that is exactly what, why we manage actually to touch those sensitive topics nowadays. But what Center for Political Beauty says, uh, they are always actually glad that uh, there is a discussion about these uh, themes, which is uh, missing actually in public uh, space and that uh, you can't hear very often in the news. And calling upon the first article of human rights declaration that human dignity is inviolable, they wanted actually to provide funeral as an act of dignity. On 21st August, Raoul Haspel launched a single one minute of silence, which will become in four days the best selling single in Austria. The Schweige Minute Dreiskirchen, which is in German for minute of silence. With this actually uh, uh, project, let's say, with this media hack, 
He wanted to call for a peaceful, silent protest against the appalling failure of the Austrian refugee policy. In Haspel's words, this is an initiation, an invitation to pause for a moment and to remember together the humanity that lies within all of us. A call to revive social values, such as empathy and the willingness to help others, not least in politics. Each cent, uh, when you purchase this song, uh, it is going actually for refugees. There are many other examples in contemporary artistic practice that one or in another way feature actual migrants, refugees, or asylum seekers. Also those coming from outside of Europe, like Immigrant Movement International by Tania Bruguera, which evolves a set of actions between migrants and local community in New York. Or Campus in Camps by Alessandro Petti, which has for a goal to offer an experimental way of education for refugees in one camp in Palestine. But there are also quite different types of projects with, uh, which express the critical potential in other ways, such as those questionings, questioning the norms of representation. How do we construct objects through language? How we can deconstruct them, like in the performances of uh, Mette Edwardson, or like performances that are challenging our understanding of time in post-Fordism, post-Fordism like in Aunt Teresa de Kersmaker's work, Arbeit. But my goal here is not to bring uh, all these examples that are dealing with migration or refugee crisis or about uh, artistic politics of, of uh, engagement. My idea was rather to show that art always possesses a political dimension and that this political aspect of art may be expressed by ways of supporting dominant politics or by challenging them. And I hope that I could bring a little bit closer to you how the theory of agonism uh, along these examples may provide the ground for thinking what the artistic politics of engagements are and also to understand how art may mobilize its critical potential. A part, in the, a part of drawing some theoretical tenets uh, with this regard, in the second part, I wanted to show through the examples that you have just seen uh, uh, one possible way of thinking what the critical art is. And then, especially drawing on uh, projects of the Center for Political Beauty and Raoul Hassel, is how art actually may react uh, at the immediate moment of any sort of crisis. I was speaking here about, uh, from the European perspective, about migration and about refugees crisis, but what art has to do at any moment of crisis, an economic, political, when we speak about the war, when we speak about any kind of authoritarian regime, if there is no freedom in public space, freedom of speech, And my idea was also to open up a question about the, uh, not only the role of art, but also about the question, what can we all do, uh, people gathered here today, in response to the fractious, fractious, hostile, and authoritarian politics? Do we need to see pictures of uh, jailed, uh, droned, uh, burned? Uh, people in order to understand that we have to find uh, ways to live together under any other crisis which could be ecological crisis like I was speaking now about the migration crisis and that's it.